Hello, I'm Ollie Skillman Wilson, 3D artist for Big Robot, currently working on our game The Signal from Tolva. For this project, we've developed a style that's a hybrid of more traditional painterly game art and modern PBR techniques. Inspired by the concept art of Ian McHugh, we wanted to capture the texture and tone of his paintings in our game world. Using a high poly sculpt of our hammerhead robot, I'm going to demonstrate some custom material and masking methods that will take us a bit off the beaten track when it comes to Didu Painter. Here, plugging in your input maps works as expected. I'm choosing to use my tangent normal, object normal, occlusion, and ID baked in X normal, while I let Didu take care of the world position gradient and curvature maps. Here's an example of one of Ian's paintings, and here we can focus in on one area and try and isolate different types of stroke we might want to replicate on our models. I'm going to start here with this clean, chunky stroke that could be useful for hard or layered surfaces and try and match its visual qualities. In this piece, the strokes have a much more granular quality, from a wetter, thicker paint, or possibly emulating the effect of painting on canvas. Getting this diversity of brushstroke across our custom material library will be extremely helpful later when we're trying to create different types of surfaces and define the difference between a grainy mud and a painted metal, for example. Didu has an excellent built-in material library. However, I'll be making minimal use of it as this tutorial is about creating materials from scratch. Instead, I'll begin by creating a 2K blank Photoshop document and starting to paint my own materials that I'll use to create a pattern of brush strokes across the model surface. By setting my brush to a neutral gray color and causing the brightness to jitter with each stroke, I can get a monochromatic texture whose tonal variation I will later use to be able to break up edges in my masks too. Using the offset filter set to half the document size, 1024 in this case, I can then paint over any seams that would appear when this material is tiled. In the brush settings, unchecking apply per tip can sometimes help you create distinction between strokes, depending on how the brush is set up. Increasing the brightness jitter will give you more contrast between strokes, or just letting the pen pressure do its thing will give you different colour values based on how hard you're pressing on your graphics tablet. In my case, I have both foreground and background colours set to grey, and the jitter is doing all the variation, as I don't want my strokes to change colour along the length of them in this material. Varying the size of your stroke can also be a great way to get a more natural feeling pattern, and I find I get the most mileage out of patterns that have this kind of variation in scale. I haven't found I've needed to create separate patterns for the specular and glossiness textures of a material, as you want to keep shapes simple to avoid too much visual noise. I do, however, create duplicates of the diffuse with some simple levels adjustments, so that Didu can read a default specular and glossiness value without me having to set this every time I use a given material on a model. The majority of our materials are very diffuse with little to no specularity, so I've set the specular and gloss textures of our custom materials accordingly. Creating the custom material and saving it as a preset you can reuse repeatedly is simple. Once you have your Didu project set up, go to the Import a Custom Material button at the top. 3Do will open, and you can start to plug your textures in and see a preview of the pattern you've painted. As these patterns are 2D focused, there's no normal, height, or occlusion data to import. You could also do some complex and interesting stuff with materials baked from decimated sculpts or other abstract modeling techniques to create your custom materials. Once everything is in place, give it a name, Dido will process it, and it's in your library for future use. There are a few pieces of my workflow that are common to pretty much every asset, and one of these is creating a base layer, a layer that all other materials are built on top of and will be revealed if another layer's masking exposes it. Usually this is some kind of bare metal, a kind of steely chrome in this case, something that makes sense to be showing through beneath another surface like dirt or scratched paint.
Here I want to combine one of my custom materials, a kind of large crosshatch pattern, with a dirty steel from the DDoO library. This way I have my custom material driving the overall look of the metal, but layer in fine detail from the DDoO library to get the model looking that bit closer to a real metal, and finding a balance between those two things. This is what I mean by a painterly PBR hybrid look. It's important I remember to set the albedo of my crosshatch pattern fairly dark so it doesn't overpower the specular properties that are important in a metal. From here I can go in and change the blend modes of the DDoO steel to overlay themselves on the custom material, so instead of replacing it they're just adding to it. Another common piece of my workflow is creating a group of layers that help define the form of a model. What they're doing in a very basic way is exaggerating the natural indirect lighting of a scene. The first layer brightens upward facing surfaces with a slight blue tint. This is just made up of a simple object space direction mask with some tweaks to contrast and gamma. Sometimes I'll choose to include a pattern from one of the custom materials, but it's such a subtle effect it's not necessary usually. Next I do the same for downward facing surfaces, using the same process. The last part of the form layer group is a kind of soft edge highlight that gives definition to shapes inside the silhouette, almost like a subsurface scattering effect through the thin details and corners. I set the top, bottom and SSS layers to normal blend mode and set their parent group to overlay. This gives a lot more control over how the colour influences the materials below it. It's worth spending some time tweaking the colour values at this point and creating a smart material because this is useful on most stylized assets. Ideally you let the game engine's lighting do the heavy lifting with a skybox, gradient or even baked solution of some kind. But if your engine's indirect lighting is a single colour ambient light, this can really help to move things away from that completely flat look when a model is in total shadow, for example. It's important to make sure your form group is only affecting your albedo texture, so I make sure to set its opacity to zero on my specular and gloss textures. The world of Planet Tolva contains a lot of painted metal, so having masking presets that can be reused between assets is going to speed things up quite a bit. One that I've relied on quite heavily is an edgeware mask that creates the effect of paint being worn away, exposing the metal underneath. It's a great way of accentuating form, whilst also lending assets a bit of history and the appearance of being used. Once I've assigned a material ID to the mask, I can start to isolate the edges using the curvature settings. Here is where we can get even more use out of our custom materials, and arguably where they make the biggest difference. I can select this texture mask to open our material library and pick one of my custom materials to break up the edges of my mask. The pattern will overlay itself, and I can start to adjust brightness, scale, and contrast values, and dial in how much I want it to affect my mask, as well as whether it is adding to or subtracting from how much of the model it's covering.
I need to make a simple rubber type material for these sleeve and neck seal pieces. The stroke 2 material doesn't have too much fine detail and will work for this. Once I've grouped it, I can name the group and assign it to the green material ID. Rubber often has lighter edges from abrasion, and we can mimic this easily with a curvature mask set to edges. I often like to use the quick edit mode for masks, so I can see the black and white of the mask, and I get a really clear view of what will and won't be displayed. Though this isn't always the best approach, as we'll see later. A lot of these masks will be quite high contrast so that layers are constrained to very defined areas. I want to give the appearance of different colours and strokes of thick paint being applied to the model, rather than lots of translucent watery layers building up. It can be nice to add a little hue variation within your materials, like a mixing palette would blend colours together while painting. As with the form layer group, layers that are only intended to affect the albedo can be set to zero opacity on the specular and gloss textures. I want my rubber to have a little more specular response than the matte paint materials so far, so I set their reflectance values accordingly. My rubber isn't quite picking up the light how I want at this point, so I need to boost the glossiness value until I can see it picking up the rubber strips on these torso support pieces. The more assets you make for a specific project, the more you will find there are common materials. On Tolva there's a fair amount of rubber and leather acting as connective tissue between the metal panelling on various models, so it's worth me saving this rubber as a smart material for later. And now that it's processed and saved, I can access it any time from the smart material library. So there's a third group of painted metal objects I want to texture next. This is a perfect excuse to use my Edge Scratch mask preset I made earlier. It's time to start thinking about a colour scheme and making some decisions about these painted metals. Often I'll pick a primary colour, an analogous secondary colour, and a complementary accent colour. So in this case, a light grey, dark grey and orange accent. I'm hitting the 1 key on the keyboard to view the albedo texture in 3D in isolation, and checking colour values without lighting. For this next material, I want to create something dark and rusted that can make up the underskeleton that the painted metal panels are attached to. I have a choice of two slightly noisier patterns from my custom materials that I think imply a more aged and pitted surface. Once it's grouped, I can give it a name and assign it to the red material ID. I often end up toning down the influence the pattern has using the texture intensity slider. It's pretty easy to overpower the details of the model with too much visual noise. I try to strike a balance between busy and readable. On top of this, I use the spray custom material, and I open up the masking tools to try and get a kind of rust effect. 
If you want to make quick edits in the Dynamask editor without sending the results to 3do, you can hold Alt when you click, just to see the edit in Photoshop first. Another common trick I like to use in this kind of stylized texturing is creating simple gradients along the natural lines of a model. In this case, the hammerhead has these long spokes bolted to his arms. I can lead the eye along their length a little by creating a layer of colour and masking it from base to tip using the gradient direction in the Dynamask editor. Once I've settled on a colour, I drag it below the rust, as it doesn't make much sense for the rust to brighten towards the tip as well. For the glass lens on the hammerhead's eye, it makes sense to start with one of the DDU presets as a base, giving me the right glossiness and specular values. Now if I'd had a bit more forethought, I would have created an emissive texture during the project creation. Luckily DDU gives me the option to add a new map, and select emissive from the menu. Once it's added all my existing layers to that map, I'm going to need to go through and make sure only the layers I need are contributing to the emission. In this case, this means setting all the groups to an opacity of zero except the window group, which has my blue lens inside it.
There's a second group of metals on this model that I want to have a slightly different feel from the galvanised looking crosshatch chrome. Something darker and noisier but still driven by their reflectivity. If I go to my custom materials, the grainy swirl has the kind of qualities I'm looking for. I just need to spend some time setting the right values for each map once I've grouped, named and assigned it to the turquoise material ID. First I need to give it a much darker albedo value and really rein in the layer's texture intensity. Next I'll set the higher glossiness value, but not as high as the chrome, this needs to be a less shiny metal with a broader specular highlight. And a mid grey is fine for the specular, not too overpowering. It's also important that I remember to set its emissive contribution to zero. The last stage of my workflow is creating a weathering group of layers. I'll save these as smart materials too, in order to be able to apply consistent weathering to models, maybe grouped by environment or material type. In this case, I'm imagining the hammerhead propped up against a mossy rock, and I want some lichen to have spread across his frame. I've selected a daub custom material that should help me recreate an abstracted version of lichen patches. Creating the lichen itself is fairly straightforward but I make sure to block it from growing in crevices and downward facing areas where it wouldn't receive sunlight. I spent quite some time experimenting with the best way to then break up the overall distribution of the lichen, starting by selecting a secondary texture that can add some larger areas of negative space. Once I'm happy with the mask, I can tweak the colour, texture intensity and so on. A dirt layer can help by adding some overall discoloration. For this one I used my grainy swirl custom material and went through the same process of setting texture intensity and colour values. In the Dynamask editor I want to make sure the dirt is building up in crevices using the curvature and ambient occlusion masks. Once I'm happy with that I can load in the grainy swirl as my secondary texture, saving the primary one for later in case I want to multiply a second pattern over the top. I want the primary texture to have quite a strong influence over the mask to break up the procedural look of it and add some randomness to the distribution of my dirt. 
Playing with the post-process options to control the overall contrast and brightness gives me a well-defined mask. I think, however, this masking gives the dirt too much of a muddy look, when I perhaps want a lighter, dustier kind of feel to the dirt, like it has settled there over time, rather than being smeared there through impact. By changing the curvature from cavities to unprocessed, I get a much softer and broader area on which to overlay my primary texture, and again using Alt to make quick edits without forcing 3D to refresh. In quick edit mode, it's quite hard to judge opacity values from the mask alone. So here is a great example of me going back into the mask and using the full shaded mode to tweak the brightness of the curvature and primary texture and get more of the dirt showing through. The final touch I want to add to the weathering group are some oil stains using the Streak custom material. This material is essentially lots of strokes painted in Photoshop holding shift to get dead straight lines, and some directional blurring applied on top. One of the limitations of quite obviously directional materials like this one is it's very dependent on your model's UV layout as to which direction your strokes will be flowing. Using the gradient and object space direction masks, I can create a base for the Streak's primary texture to cut into. From there on in, it's mostly a lot of playing with contrast and brightness values to get the right density and length of oil streaks. Once that's done, I can set the glossiness and specular values to represent the oil's wetness. So that's all I have to share with you. I hope I was able to show you something new, 
my thanks to Quixel for giving me the chance to talk about my work and make sure you all check out The Signal from Tolva when it's released this year.